when I first became a Christian, I was like very eager in my faith. I was very excited about Jesus. I wanted to follow him. I took my faith very, very seriously right from the get-go. And yet, as, as awesome as that was, that led to a real struggle for me where I was so serious about it that when I was doing well in my faith, I was like, man, I was pr almost proud, almost self-righteous. And then I would commit some sin or something I've been struggling with. I'd lose my temper, something like that. And, I, and then I'd beat myself up and, oh, and I'd pray, Lord, I'm so sorry. I can't believe I did that again. And I can't believe I have to ask you for forgiveness again. And, and man, I, you know, I just beat myself up with guilt and shame and self-doubt. And, and this struggle was real for me right from the beginning of my, my Christian faith. Can any of you relate to that struggle? You know, and my experience has been that a lot of people feel that way. And they just feel this angst of, I hope I'm doing enough to really please God. I hope I'm I'm, uh, you know, obeying him enough. I, I hope indeed that I really am living like a child of God. And this passage and these words I want to look at in this episode have the power to, to give us greater assurance, greater security, greater confidence in our relationship with God. So let's jump over to Romans. I want to look at Romans chapter 3. That's the passage we'll be in. And let me just set up the context so we understand exactly where we're at in the flow of Paul's thought. In Romans chapter 3, what Paul has done so far is basically he has gone through and shown how it doesn't matter whether you're from a completely pagan and moral background, whether you're from a decent home and a good moral background, whether you're from a religious background, that all of us have done things that we know are wrong. All of us, in Paul's words, have sinned. All of us have broken the rules in some way, gone against things we knew were wrong, and all of us, therefore, are guilty. And he has ended that uh, section right before the paragraph I want to look at by essentially saying, stringing together a list of Old Testament quotes that point out how, man, all of us are guilty. None of us are totally righteous. And so by the standard of God's law, we are guilty as charged. That's where he has left off. I want to pick up in Romans 3.21 and really want to focus a little bit later, but we have to hear the, the whole flow of thought. So Romans 3.21, Paul writes these words. He says, but now, apart from the law, meaning the Old Testament law, the righteousness of God has been manifested. The righteousness of God is used all over the Old Testament, particularly in the Psalms, for God's saving justice, for God's ability to deliver and save. And so God's saving justice has been manifest, has been made clear, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. So it's apart from the law, but it's witnessed to by the law and the prophets. So it's in sync with them. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. So God's saving justice is available through faith in Jesus Christ for everybody who believes in him. For there's no distinction. doesn't matter whether you're a Gentile or a Jew in Paul's context. doesn't matter whether you're religious or non-religious. doesn't matter whether you're from a good moral background or from whatever, right? There's no distinction. So if you believe in Jesus, wherever you've come from, whatever your background has been like, God's saving justice is available to you simply by trusting in Jesus. Why is that? Well, as he's already proven, he now restates, verse 23, for all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. The glory that God has for them, the glory that God created them with as his image bearers, the very glory that is God's own character and wisdom, right? We've all fallen short of that. And now here's the, the part I want us to get into. So where we can all experience God's saving justice. How? Well, look at 324. He says this, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption, which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in the forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time so that he would be both just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. Man, that is a dense paragraph of Scripture, and we need to maybe hear 
some of these words, define some of these terms so we can really understand what it says. So I want to work backwards for, through the text and then work back towards the very beginning of verse 24 so we understand the logic of what's going on here, all right? So here's, here's what he says. He says, we've been justified through the redemption, which is in Christ, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation. So I want to take those three words, propitiation, redemption, and justify. What do those words mean? Uh, let's take the first one, propitiation. That word shows up there in verse 25, and that is sort of the foundation for the redemption and the justification that's described. So what does the word propitiation mean? It's just not a word we use every day, right? Like, when was the last time in your everyday speech you used the word propitiation? Oh, this is my propitiation. We just don't do that, right? It's just not a very common word. Um, certain translations translate it as like atoning sacrifice or things of that sort in an attempt to try to clarify. But I don't even think that clarifies it. It. I mean, like atoning sacrifice, what's that For on one hand? On the other hand, it doesn't let us know that there's a word here that's a really big word that we don't know what it means. And so let's just take this word propitiation. What does it mean? And here's the basic idea. The basic idea of the word propitiation is an offering to turn away anger, an offering to turn away anger. In other words, now let's imagine, kind of facetiously, but let's imagine uh, me as a husband did something to upset my wife. And uh, being the husband that I am, I know she likes chocolate. And, uh, and so uh, I want to let her know I'm deeply sorry. And so on my way home from work, I pick up a box of chocolates. And when I come home, I, instead of going right in the house, I knock on the door. And when she comes to the door, I'm down on one knee and I say, Oh, my love, here, please accept my propitiation. My simple little offering to turn away your anger. Now, that's a bad example, right? It's a bad analogy. But you get the idea. Propitiation is an offering to turn away anger. And in the Old Testament of the Bible, where kind of the background to this whole passage, that would happen on the Day of Atonement. Once a year, under the Old Covenant, the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies in the temple, and he would do so with uh, the blood of an offering, and he would sprinkle that blood on the, the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, the atoning place in the, the temple. He would sprinkle that blood on the mercy seat, and that would be the atonement. That would be the offering to uh, turn away God's wrath, turn away God's anger. That's the basic idea of the word, is that it's an offering to make atonement. It's an offering to turn away God's just penalty for sin. God's wrath is not unpredictable. It's not capricious. It's not something that, you know, you one day he's going to be mad, one day he's not. God's wrath is simply his just penalty for sin. And so propitiation is an offering to appropriately deal with uh, to, to take care of God's just penalty for sin. Well, what is that propitiation here in context? Well, it's the redemption which is in Christ Jesus. So there's the next word we need to talk about. The redemption which is in Christ Jesus. Well, what does redemption mean? Well, redemption is a payment of a price to set someone or something free. That's the basic idea of that word. In the everyday world of Paul and the Romans, one of the most common places the word redemption was used was in the slave market. Um, slavery was everywhere present in the ancient world. 20 to 25 percent of the population uh, at any given time would be slaves in the Roman Empire. It was just part of the social fabric of the day. It wasn't like the American experience of slavery where it was a racial thing for, you know, one particular race in the ancient world, in the Greco-Roman world. It was um, kind of an equal opportunity venture. Anybody could be a slave at any given time, and you could be born into slavery. You could be a prisoner of war and become a slave. Uh, they didn't have Chapter 11 bankruptcy, so if you couldn't pay off your debts, you could be a slave to pay off your debts. So there was various ways you could become a slave, and just about anyone could be a slave at any given time. There are even ways to get out of slavery. So it was everywhere present. And if, if say, your cousin had through bad financial management, become a debtor to somebody else and thus became a slave to them to work off their debts and you wanted to, quote-unquote, redeem him, 
well, maybe what you would do would be, you know, pass the hat as a family and you would take up an, a, an offering, a collection, and then you would go down on Saturday to the slave market and now the master was going to just sell off your cousin because he wasn't working very hard and he wasn't a very good slave in the first place and he thought he could make more by selling him. So now he's selling him at the slave market and you could take all that money and you could, uh, you could pay a price to buy your cousin out of slavery, buy him back from slavery, you had redeemed him. That's the idea of redemption. It's a payment of a price to set someone or something free. That's the basic idea. And in the Old Testament, again, the backdrop theologically for this, the great act of redemption was when God set Israel free from their slavery to Egypt in the Exodus account. And so God redeemed them, it says, by his strong uh, right arm. He redeemed them out of slavery. And so Paul now says that the ultimate act of redemption, the ultimate deliverance from slavery that God provided, is through Jesus Christ. How? By offering him as a propitiation. When Jesus goes to the cross and hangs on the cross, he is offering himself in our place for the just penalty of our sins. And so God pours out the penalty on Jesus so that we could be redeemed. We could be um, set free from our slavery to sin and slavery to the penalty of sin. And now we could be set free from both the power and the penalty of sin. That's what redemption means. What's the ultimate, ultimate result of that? Well, that's the other word we want to look at. At the beginning of verse 24, we are justified. Everybody has sinned. Everybody's fallen short of God. And we are justified as a gift by his grace because Jesus offered himself as a propitiation and a redemption for our sins. And so now we can be justified. Well, what does that word justified mean? Well, the word justified it really comes from the law courts. So propitiation comes from the religious realm. Redemption comes from sort of the marketplace realm. And justified comes from the legal realm. And uh, basically the idea of justified is what happens when a judge is uh, about ready to declare the verdict in some court case or some crime, right? And and there is the accused standing before the judge, and the judge declares the verdict. And to be justified is to be given a favorable verdict, being declared not guilty as a verdict before the court. That's the idea. So picture a judge pounding down his gavel and saying, not guilty, no penalty for you. You are declared not guilty. And so what this is saying is, those of us who put our faith in Jesus are now declared not guilty by God. Wait a second. Hold on. We really are guilty. Paul has just proved that in the first three chapters of Romans. All of us have sinned. We've all fallen short. We all are guilty before the law. So how is it that a just and good law-abiding judge, a law-keeping judge, can declare us not guilty? Well, he can do that because the penalty was already paid in Jesus as a propitiation. And thus, we can be set free from the penalty, and so God can justly and appropriately give us a favorable verdict, declare us not guilty. And that's why in verse 26, Paul can say, God did this to demonstrate his saving justice, his righteousness, so that he would be both just and the justifier of the person who has faith in Jesus. He's just, he upholds the law, and he is the acquitter, the justifier, the one who sets the criminal free, sets the captive free, the justifier of those who have faith in Jesus. And so what you hear in this text, in this very compressed uh, paragraph, you hear that in Christ Jesus, our sins have appropriately and already been punished. They've been dealt with. The penalty has been paid. God, therefore, can now set us free from both the penalty and the power of sin, and we've been redeemed so that God, in a just and justifying way, can declare us not guilty and set us free from our sins. When I understood this text, when I I read this text, and all of a sudden it made sense. I had someone explain it to me, just like I've explained it to you. All of a sudden, all that striving, all that pressure to perform, all that need to be good enough, 
all that guilt that I would beat myself up with, man, it was like uh, the, the, the pressure was lifted as I understood this text. And now I realized I didn't have to be good enough. I didn't have to measure up. I didn't have to try to pay God back or prove God that I was worth dying for. I didn't have to do any of that because my sins had been completely and fully dealt with. And I stood before God 100% forgiven, 100% justified, 100% not guilty. Not because I had done enough. Not because I had been perfect enough, not because I had been good enough, but simply because Jesus had paid the penalty for my sin. He was my propitiation. And I now uh, was no longer someone who was in any way remotely under the wrath of God or liable to the wrath of God. I had been declared not guilty and given a favorable verdict before God. I was forgiven and I was set free. I was teaching this at a pastor's conference in Haiti a number of years ago. I was actually teaching a whole week-long conference on preaching and um, helping these Haitian pastors get some training on how to put together sermons and how to teach the Word of God to their people. And uh, I wanted to do sort of a, a model sermon for them as part of that conference. And so I actually took this text and just preached a quick 20, 25 minute little model sermon for them on this passage because I figured people all over the world struggle with trying to be good enough for God and really struggle to understand grace and forgiveness. And so I preach through this text. Well, two or three days later, at the end of the week, as members of this pastor's conference just sort of shared some of their reflections on the conference, one pastor stood up. His name was Remy, and he stood up, and he had tears streaming down his cheeks, and he said, I just want to thank you, Mr. John, for sharing what you did out of Romans chapter 3. I never really understood how my sins could be forgiven, and I never understood grace like I, I now do. And ever since the day you taught Romans 3 to me and you showed me that my sins had already been, uh, the penalty for my sins had already been paid for in Jesus, I have been praying with so much more joy than I ever have before. And man, that made my whole week worth it. And I, in the grace of God, I pray and I trust that he took that same message back to his church and back to his people and he could share with them how God's grace was sufficient. Not because God swept our sins under the carpet and pretended like they were no big deal. No, they were an incredibly big deal to God. So big of a deal that he sent his very own son to be the propitiation and the redemption for our sins so that he could give us a favorable verdict and declare us not guilty. That's the great truth of Romans chapter 3. Thanks to all of you who donate through Patreon or through World Family Mission. You're the ones who make this ministry possible. And I would love to invite more of you to consider donating over on my Patreon page. I'm actually going to begin doing kind of a big overview of the book of Romans um, and just walking through that over the next handful of months. And so I provide extra resources there and some additional podcasts. And so Swing on over to my Patreon page, check that out, become a patron of the Bible and Life Ministry to help this ministry continue on. So thanks for your support. Thanks for your encouragement. God bless you guys, and we will talk again soon.